Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julio Robledo, and I'm a project officer for quality improvement and reform here at Brisbane or PHN. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar, Setting Up Your Practice for Health Assessments. I'd like to start this webinar with an acknowledgement to country. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians across the land in which we meet today. We acknowledge the waterways, the land, the sky. We acknowledge their ancestors and elders and recognize those who continue to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. We acknowledge the past and stand together for our future. So some housekeeping rules. Everyone is gonna be on mute and with camera off for default. If during the session you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A. We'll do our best to get to your uh, questions as soon as possible or afterwards when, we, when you receive the documents after the webinar. Uh, we ask for, all, for your help to fill the survey after the webinar. It's gonna pop up in a new uh, browser tab. So please fill, fill the survey. It's going to help us tailor these type of sessions to your needs. And for those people interested in gaining the certificates, you have to fill the, the survey. It's going to come up at the at the end as a question. So we know who, who wants to get the certificates. And finally, this session is being, is being recorded. You're going to receive this session along with some other resources after the fact, after the webinar. So um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce your speaker today, Jane Caligeros. She's from CDM Plus, provide training products and resources for health professionals in primary health care, aged care, community, and disability to empower them to deliver long-term quality care and coordination. So welcome, Jane. Please uh, take over. Thanks, Julio. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. It's a two-part webinar series on health assessments. Um, today's webinars uh, to help you get set up, uh, ready to do lots and lots of health assessments. So uh, we're going to have a look at some of the processes. So hopefully, um, if you don't have a process in place, um, it's a really good time to um, look at the content that we're going to put together, and then you can apply that learning uh, to implement a health assessment process. So this is a really good time to get the team together and look at what is working well, what needs improvement. Um, and also the, I guess, the back end of health assessment. So looking at your different um, appointment types, getting your templates reviewed and updated, um, if that needs to happen, and some tech shortcuts if you don't have those. So um, I think identifying everyone that is actually eligible is such a big job as well. So we're going to um, give you some top tips for that today as well. So let's look at the health assessments. Um, for me, I think the one of the most confusing things with health assessments is that there's so many of them. And I guess even the patients will sometimes say to us, you know, but I had my care plan done last week. What's the difference between that and the health assessment? So um, from a Medicare point of view, they've got different requirements. But a health assessment is really, um, we put it under the bracket of the chronic disease management activities. Uh, and the, the purpose of that is to, I guess, do an overall um, evaluation of the, the um, patient's health. And usually we'll put some strategies in place for lifestyle modifications or um, some early detection activities that might also be due as well. But we're, we're trying to identify that risk and then minimise the risk, I guess, is the quick way um, to describe it. Now, there's actually 11 different types of health assessments, which is, I think, why everyone kind of just takes a step back from them. Um, so we're gonna kind of hopefully make that a little bit easier to break down and understand. So I break those 11 health assessments into three different types. So we've got our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health check. So there's three age-based health assessments. There's our time-based health assessments and then the heart health assessment as well. Now we've got a little flow chart to help, I guess, reduce the confusion and, and just help you decide what health assessment to do on a patient. Um, we've kind of uh, allocated those. Um, so financially, it's the best flow um, because obviously some patients are eligible for more than one different type of um, health assessment. So we've gone through and does the patient identify as First Nations? Um, if they are, my preferred pathway is always to go um, through the 715 and it's mainly because it will actually trigger those allied health visits 
plus the, the follow-up numbers for the nurse or Aboriginal health practitioner. Now, this flowchart's been updated to include the new changes uh, with the 715s as well. So the 715 will actually trigger 10 allied health visits. And the other change is that um, a patient that identifies as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island can also now have a heart health assessment within that 12 months as well. So they're the two big changes um, that have come along with, with the health assessments in this year. And then we've also provided a quick little, I guess, quick glance um, billing just with the different types of um, Medicare and, and DBA items there as well. So I think when you're, you know, getting your processes in place, obviously billing is going to be one of those. So I think just make sure the team's aware of the different um, types and then what, what the billing pathways are as well. All right, let's have a look at the health assessment processes. Uh, and I know it might sound like you've already got one in place for some of the CDM activities, but a lot of the practices we work with um, don't usually have one in place um, for a lot of the CDM. It might be for the care plans and reviews, but not necessarily the health assessment. So what's in the process? Um, I think for me, the process just comes down to who does what when. And I try to keep the processes as simple as, simple as possible, and that's so they become ingrained in our um, day to day. So um, I think everyone needs to have an idea of what needs to happen before, during and after the appointment. And so this is a really good time to get the team together and talk to them about, um, you know, maybe this is the time that you want to improve um, the health assessments. You might have some of the recent reports and we'll talk about that towards the end as well. Um, some reports to actually look at what you've um, been doing over the previous 12 months for health assessments um, from a billing point of view. And then talk about what are the things that are working well. So uh, is it that you're doing really, really well in the over 75 health checks, but you haven't done any of the other adult health checks like the 40 to 49 or 45 to 49 as an example. So I think it's really good to get everyone's feedback um, and especially involve admin because they play a really, really important part in everything to do with chronic disease management and including um, the health assessment activities because they'll usually see the patient before and after that appointment. So for me, there's a couple of tasks that I find really helpful um, to keep chronic disease management going long term. So before the appointment, I definitely want to make sure that the patient's actually eligible for that particular CDM activity, in this case, um, the health assessment. And then before or on arrival, they're actually updating different parts of the record as well. So the patient details and, and any registrations that they might need as well. But for me, the um, checking eligibility is a big one because we don't want to go through all of the hard work, the patients turned up, and then we, we aren't actually able to um, build that particular item up. Uh, the nurses and Aboriginal health workers, they, they're also got a really important um, role for health assessments, and it's usually around the collection of that information. Now, I guess the biggest question I usually get asked um, is how long should an appointment be for a health assessment or care plan, etc. So to me, the personal preference um, for myself is as a nurse, I would like between that 45 minutes or 60 minutes, and it's um, due to the fact that, especially in a health assessment, we're usually going to get a lot of information and a lot of other activities that can be completed. So as an example, when we're looking at, you know, risk factors, updating family history, we're going to recognise that the patient might be actually due for some other preventative activities. And that might include a skin check or cervical screening, or they've got a chronic condition and they don't have a care plan in place. So for me, I take that time, but for every health assessment, you can usually book between two and three other appointments. So yes, of course, we can record some ops and get things done, you know, in a 15 minute time slot, but I try to look at the bigger picture. And for me, the bigger picture is looking at that overall um, health and, you know, the prevention activities are, are usually part of that as well. So it's something to discuss with the team. I know a lot of clinics will do different times for different types of health checks. I prefer to keep it easy for admins. They don't yell at me, no, they don't. 
Um, but I, I prefer to actually keep it as 45 minutes for all our health assessments or an hour for all our care plans or whatever it might be, just to make it a little bit easier in the booking process. So it's something to discuss with the team about what you're actually wanting um, to achieve from, from doing um, additional health assessments. The GPs will also um, play an important role and they're gonna review all of that information that has been uh, recorded and then put that into a plan. So whether it's um, involving lifestyle modifications, it might be that you know referrals come from that um, particular health assessment or coming back to, you know, get blood results and things like that as well. So the GP will provide all of that advice and information in the part of the appointment that they have with them as well. And same thing, the it's really, I guess, difficult sometimes with uh, different GP preferences on how long that their appointment is going to be. So same thing, if you can make it consistent across the practice, um, for the GPs, that would be great. So as an example, it might be 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it might be um, in your practice. So just makes it a little bit easier for the team. And then back to reception after the appointment. So after the, I guess, billing's been finalised, and I guess this is something to have a discussion about with your clinic. I know that some practices don't go too far ahead in their appointment book. I'm a very big fan of the next appointment and it's because I see it do a couple of different things. But if we have a, a patient that comes out of that health assessment, as I said, they've um, I can see that they're due for things like a skin check and um, whatever other screening might be due, we can actually get them to put that in on the way out. And the reason I prefer to do that, I will still put a reminder in, but they're actually more likely to turn up to the appointment if they're booking that themselves on the way out because they take ownership of that appointment um, and process. So I'm a really big fan of booking anything else that might need to um, happen from that health assessment. But I also uh, get admin to actually book the next health assessment. Now, um, in next week's one, we'll probably have a look at the flow chart a little bit um, closer, but a lot of the health assessments we can actually do um, every nine to 12 months. So as an example, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health check will be every nine months. So if I did a 715 in the clinic today, I'd get admin to book in the next 715 in nine months' time. If someone came in for an over 75 health check, I'd get admin to book the next um, over 75 health check. Now, I know the time-based assessments, um, as an example, the 40 to 49 um, is that health assessment uh, for those at risk of diabetes that we can only do every three years. The 45 to 49 is a once only. So as an example, if I did one of those in the clinic today, I can still get the patient to come back in for a health assessment in 12 months' time. And that would be as a heart health check. So this is, I guess, something to discuss with the practice team about what your thoughts are in, in doing that. Yeah, sure, you can still put a reminder in, but I don't want to just rely on the reminder process because it takes time and it costs the clinic money to kind of allocate against that as well. But if we get the patient engaged in this appointment, and I guess the whole idea is that we want to do regular um, health checks to kind of keep them well. So if we can get them to book in in 12 months' time for their next health assessment, whether that's a time-based or a heart health check or the 715, then they're more engaged in that whole process and they're more likely to turn up. So that's something to consider as well. So our next little section, we're going to look at the actual setup of the practice. So what do you actually need to set your practice up? I've split it into two sections of those like little uh, checklists across the next few slides. So when you do get the copy of slides, you might want to print those out and you can kind of divide and conquer um, some of these tasks with your team. Um, but let's start with the patient um, side of the, the setup. And I've got there things like reviewing the, the patient data to understand your demographics, identifying priority groups and eligible patients, um, and then defining the marketing plan to encourage um, patient participation. Now, from a data point of view, I think it's really important to know who your 5,000, 6,000, 10,000, 20,000 patients are. And what I mean by that is, how old are they? What does that actually look like from a breakdown? So I've worked in so many different clinics over the years and you know, some clinics will have 
you know, thousands of patients over the age of 75, but not many patients that would kind of qualify for a heart health check as an example in that younger age group. I've worked in a lot of Aboriginal medical services. We've got 95% of patients that identify as First Nations. So I think it's really important to know um, what your patient demographics uh, look like because this will help um, be to actually develop a plan um, and figure out who are your priority groups. The other little point I popped in that one was to just, uh, you know, consider smaller projects because it's a 12-month you know, a period. And for those that are participating in the, the QIP, it might be something that you might want to align um, and that will need some planning. So have a look at the health promotion calendars, have a look at your, your QI quarters um, and see what projects you want to um, focus on once you have that data in front of you. Now, I've got a couple of slides there just on primary sense. So there's lots of different ways that you can actually extract that data to have a look at your patient demographics. So it might be that you're using best practice, you can search your patients and, and look at the different age groups and um, ethnicities and, and you know whether they're ADF and things like that, just from the basic utility search of patients. You can do something similar with a medical director as well. But I've got a couple of slides there just on primary sense. So um, the primary sense, primary sense is a um, PHN owned and operated um, decision support tool for general practices. So it allows you to extract that data. There's different types of reports um, that are available as well. So I've just put the couple of quick steps. If you were looking at health assessments in particular, um, it would be to open the primary sense reports, um, select health assessment uh, reports, um, and then scroll through those different health assessment categories. So there's lots of different ways, but this is a really important step. You might take some other steps while you're doing this to, you know, um, do some data cleansing and things like that as well. So it just depends where your clinic's at and what extraction tools um, you might be using as well. So those priority groups, um, once you've actually narrowed down your um, demographics, I usually would kind of look at the, that health assessment flowchart as an example and try and figure out where our um, population lies. So um, as I said, if you've got 5% of your um, uh, patients that are uh, identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you're going to be targeting those patients for a 715 health check. If you've got um, a number of other patients that might qualify for the over 75 as an example, you can start targeting those um, patients for that different type of health assessment. So depending on where your clinic's at um, and obviously the resources and things available, um, but I think take that bigger demographic, break it down into smaller um, groups to figure out the priorities. Um, there's a couple of different times of year that work really well, and this will bring me, I guess, to the marketing plan um, of when we're actually going to target patients. So the marketing plan is really important um, because these will usually take some planning um, and you're going to have posters and leaflets and, and other things to help engage the patients as well. So when you're having that team meeting, I think discuss these challenges that might have um, arisen before. So what are some of the challenges when admin have gone to contact people and, and book them in for a health assessment, as an example? I'll tell you one of the ones that I used to get like all the time in some of the clinics I've worked in is that the clinic only opens sometimes Monday to Friday um, during business hours and people are working full time. So those biggest challenges around those 40 to 49, 45 to 49, and even getting people in for a heart health check, they're in that age group where they're usually working full time. It's actually difficult for them um, to come in for a preventative health check. So they're the people we usually see when they're sick. Um, and so we've got to, I guess, address our marketing um, plan to encourage those people in. So as an example, it might be that you open Saturday mornings or that um, some clinics that I've worked with will kind of offer like Thursday night, we kind of stay till 8 or 9 p.m. as an example. So I think have that um, conversation with the team um, and just uh, address the challenges first. Um, so then when admin or whoever might be booking those appointments in, we can address those concerns with, with the patients as well. 
Um, and then what materials are you going to need? Um, <clears throat> so as an example, if it's uh, one of the awareness months or weeks or, or days, um, you might have some of those promotional materials like posters and pamphlets, et cetera. Um, a lot of the, I guess, um, plans that come out of a health assessment are going to be lifestyle modifications. So it's also a really great time to have some pamphlets around that. And it might be that you're accessing those through Health Pathways or um, you might already have some material. So when we're thinking about smoking, nutrition, alcohol, physical activity. So that's pretty much every single patient that we're having those conversations with. So it's great to have some information to be able to hand out on the day. Um, how are we actually going to communicate with patients that might be eligible for a health check? Um, my preferred way would be um, by phone or recognising that they're actually um, due in the clinic and then getting them to book in. Because as I said, they're more likely to turn up to that appointment um, if we're actually getting them to book that on the day. So it might be that they're in for something else, um, like in through the treatment room or in with the GP and they recognise that they're due for, you know, it might be a heart health check. So they might give them the pathology form and get them to book that on the way out. So these are all, I guess, different ways to consider. Some of the letters work really well um, depending on the target group as well. Um, so as an example, one clinic um, that I've kind of worked with, they did birthday cards for the 40-year-olds. And on the outside, it's like happy birthday. They send it out to all their patients as they turn 40. Um, and then on the inside, it had the OSRIS tool inside it. So I think we've got to think outside the box to get patients um, engaged as well. Um, the next, I guess, part of it, uh, with the marketing plan, it's really good to do with the practice 12 month plan because they are aligned together. Um, you'll need to know the 12 month plan um, before you can, I guess, uh, decide on those marketing activities. The practice, um, we want to define that process. So those roles that we looked at before with reception, um, the nurse or health worker and GP, we really need to know um, who's doing what and then maybe just um, if you need to have that as a written process as an example. Um, and then defining that process and actually onboarding the team. So as we said, reception, see the, the patient before and after. So it's really important that we're actually onboarding all team members, um, not just the clinical side. So everyone's on the same page. And then how are we going to onboard new team members? They'll kind of refer back to the process. So don't forget, you know, this is not going to be set in stone. It's kind of an evolving um, thing. So I think it's good to have those ongoing reviews and, and take the feedback on board of what worked really well, what didn't, and then, you know, you're going to be tweaking things from there. Uh, the 12-month plan, as I said, you're going to review that data, find your priority groups, and then I'm a big fan of making them into smaller groups because it makes it a little bit more achievable. Um, so I think have a look at your quarters um, and then figure out what you want to do. So as an example, this month is Lung Health Awareness Month. Um, so you might want to target, you know, particular patients in that time. For me, every single month is a health assessment month. So we usually would deck out the practice for whichever, uh, whichever health promotion was on, but it's mainly to emotionally connect with the patients. So as an example, if they've got a family history of breast cancer and they see the breast cancer awareness month coming up in October um, and they come into your clinic, they've heard the awareness campaigns, they're more likely to book in for a health check because it's going to be on their mind. So, you know, we all saw it with, um, you know, things with like when Shane warned on, we had a lot of um, people presenting to the clinic for their heart health checks. So I think people will emotionally connect, even if you're not doing a dedicated activity around that health promotion just having that awareness in, in your practice each month. So it might even just be one of the small posters at the front desk or, you know, as part of your socials and things like that. So I've also given you a little um, health promotion planner and we broke it down into the day, week and month. And this is not every single, you know, health promotion activity um, available. This is on those, I guess, top 12 conditions that we uh, will usually target at a, at a primary care level. So... Um, you'll get that as a PDF with the link, so you can go back and if that helps you with your planning process as well. Uh, and then the next little thing was just around the appointment. So um, I'm going to just show you something quickly um, in best practice as an example, but just 
have a look at your current appointment types for health assessments. Um, consider those different workflows. As I said, I prefer the same amount of time regardless of the health assessment. But if you are going to have different appointment times for those different types of appointments, then you're going to need to um, set those up in the background. Um, I just did something really basic. I've just got best practice open as an example just to show you, but I prefer to have the different types of health checks um, actually listed there. And that's mainly because we can go back and look at the reporting, you know, specifically for those different appointment types, um, especially the time base to break those up. Um, a little bit more, but it, it just really depends on what you want to do. Uh, the next little thing to have a look at as part of your setup checklist is the templates. Now, I can't tell you how important this step is. Um, I hate paperwork and I hate typing. So for me, if I can generate that information that comes straight across into the template that I'm using, it saves me so much time. I don't want to sit there. No one wants to sit there at the end of the day to um, kind of tidy up any um, paperwork. So we want to make sure we're getting that done in the actual appointment. So um, one of the other resources we've given you guys as part of the, the webinar series is to actually have a template that you can import. Now, depending on what you're using, Medical Director, we've, we've got one, you just use the, the same template unless you're using the, the wizard um, for some of the 715s or the over 75s. Um, and then in best practice, you've actually got the... EPC section where you can use that for the over 75, the 45 to 49, um, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health checks. So um, for those other health assessments, you'll need a, a Word document. Uh, and then the last or second last little one around the, the practice setup will be your text shortcuts. Now, next uh, webinar, I'll actually be doing a, a demo um, on a health assessment, but I've just got an example up there like I've got autofills for all the different types of health assessments. So this really helps your team get on the same page and helps with that information gathering if I've got my tech shortcut laid out. Now, if you've set up your templates, I would usually pull this straight across into the template I was using. So I'm not actually having to document things twice. So that's just an example. You don't have to do it like that. But as I said, it really helps the team get on the same page if we're actually doing them in the same format. It just makes it very consistent. And then the last little bit will be um, around the reporting. Now, if you start making changes for health assessments, it can be really, really um, good, but it's good to measure that. So um, I recommend doing a baseline report. So you actually want to see what you've been doing in the previous 12 months. Um, specifically around health assessment revenue. In clinics we work with, we usually look at the whole CDM revenue. Um, but for health assessments, you want to kind of keep track of what you're doing um, month on month. So I put there for the month and quarter reports um, against that baseline. So if you broke down and you did, say, 1,000 health assessments in that last 12 months, um, so I make it 12,000, make it easier, um, that means you're doing, you know, a thousand per month. What does that look like, you know, month on month as you're kind of progressing through the year? And it's really important to communicate those progress and wins back to the practice team because everything in chronic disease management can actually seem really, really slow um, and feels like you're not actually doing any improvement. So I think it's really important to feed that back to the team to, you know, encourage that continuous quality improvement. So that's it from me today. Um, I'll see whoever's registered ready for next week um, for the next webinar. We've actually offered a little promotion for anyone that wants to kind of purchase any services or products. Um, so there's a little QR code um, and it'll be in the slides when you get that as well. But it's just an opportunity if you wanted to access some of the templates or, or training, et cetera, you can access that. Um, and then for those that are attending the webinar next week, it's going to be all about unlocking the potential of health assessment. So I'll do a webinar um, health assessment demo um, in that session next week, and we'll have a closer look at the different types of health assessments in that one. So if there's any questions, um, we'll have a look at that, but I'm going to hand over to Julio to actually look at the continuous quality improvement um, initiatives for 2024. So thanks everyone, and I'll see you next week.
Thank you so much, uh, Jane, for, okay. for, for your presentation. So um, for everyone out there, we you might be thinking now, how do we transform this into a continuous quality improvement in initiative, right? Oh, apologies. Apologies. So um, this might look a little bit familiar to you. You know, how do we do continuous quality improvement? And and you might you might answer just to one of the following questions. So are you someone who struggles to integrate continuous quality improvement activities to fulfill accreditation and PIPQI criteria? Do you conduct conduct CQI but often fail to document your processes? Do you start continuous quality improvement activities but then lose momentum before completion? Um, do you find assembling a continuous quality improvement team a challenge and leaving the responsibility often on the shoulders of one individual? So if you answer yes to any of these questions, don't worry, we're here to help. So we have a whole team in the Brisbane North PHN that is dedicated to helping you through your journey of continuous quality improvement and to translate this type of information of health assessment to a continuous quality improvement activity. So what are the benefits of participating? You first have an enhanced CQI strategies with our team. You got experience, tailor, efficient and low stress CQI processes. You gain expert guidance and support from our team, a comprehensive support for meeting accreditation criteria and planning and fulfilling PIPQI requirements. You can also access some professional development activities and you can leverage new resources that we have available throughout our uh, new channels and traditional channel channels. So what is your role? What is expected for you if you decide to engage with Brisbane North PHN? So first, we would like you to create a, a quality improvement team in hand by hand with our quality improvement and development engagement officers. So this team could look like uh, your engagement officer, your general practitioner, and a practice nurse, uh, sorry, a practice manager, a nurse. You know, you, you have to build your own quality improvement team. Then we would like you to start with a one hour kickoff with one of our engagement officers where you would set goals, document them using a plan, do, study, act uh, chart, and then follow through on a three month period. After engaging in this activity for three months, then we would like you to have a uh, one hour follow up with your engagement officer to review the process and finish documentation of the PDSA cycle. We would like, to, we would like you to share PDSA with uh, some success stories with your QI and the engagement officer to contribute to collective knowledge and ongoing improvement. And feel free to reach out to your QI and the engagement officer for additional assistance such as uh, more face-to-face -face meetings, phone consultations for other support all throughout your activities. So we have some ideas on how you can translate health assessments directly into a continuous quality activity. We have four different activities planned for you. The first one is a very simple ethnicity PDSA that it involves improving the data quality that you have. So it's recording those ethnicities. The second activity that we have is another PDSA cycle pre-fill for you where you have, uh, where the intention is to increase the number of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health assessment performed in your clinic. You could also decide to engage in a mini audit specifically targeted to those uh, at high risk type two diabetes patients in the 40 to 49 um, age group. Or if any of these uh, activities don't seem to work that well for you, you can also choose your own adventure. So the ethnicity PDSA, is, this is what it looks like. It's a pre-filled template. It's an example. You can take this and put it and, and tropicalize it to your own practice. This would be the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Assessment, where you have a set of steps, a set of um, examples where you can follow and increase the number of health assessments that perform in our region. This is what the mini audit looks like. And if none of this convince you, then you can also come to our uh, practice support website or you can engage with your uh, engagement officers and you can come up with an activity that is tailored towards your, your clinic. If um, you're interested in participating with us at the Brisbane North PHN, please reach out to our email, practice support uh, email. You also can see in the in the slide the phone number. And we, as I said, we have a new practice support website. So have a look at the website, 
play around with it. There's a lot of information there, not only for, for practice managers, for all the, the staff in, in your practice. And I would like to remind you that please, uh, when we finish this webinar, there's a, a survey is going to pop up. Please answer the survey. It's going to help us tailor a lot of this content to you guys and to your needs. So please fill out the survey. If you're interested or need the certificate, uh, fill the, the survey, and we're going to be sending the certificate to you in case you need um, CPD hours. So do you want to submit CPD hours? So that, that will be all uh, on my side. So I thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you for participating on on this uh, webinar.